So yeah, today I, I want to, to start with, uh, with another subject, the uh, matrix values and variables, and uh, in particular, uh, tail bounds for sums of independent and variables. So for this purpose, um, I want to I want to remind you of some some facts in, in probability that maybe you are all aware of, but it's, it's maybe good to look at this to see how this can be generalized to matrices. So if we have x1 to xn and maybe even further iid random variables uh, taking values in the in the reals, then. Uh, then we can form uh, empirical means. And of course, it's well known that if the, if the uh, random variables have uh, an expectation, then it's probability 1. That's the, let me put this as a limit. It's the, the law of large numbers. And, uh, and in statistics, or in general, in, in any kind of applications, we, are, we don't really care that much about these statements, because we have no way of actually performing this limit. We, look, we are interested in how likely is it that this empirical mean deviates significantly from, uh, from, from the expectation. So. And this is the subject of small, medium, and large deviations. And I want, I want to discuss the large deviation setting. So for finite n, what you would like to have is good bounds on the, on the probability that, for example, a finite mean is larger than, uh, it's OK, let me introduce some notation for this. For this mu for mean, so the, the empirical average is larger than some uh, alpha. And of course, the idea is that alpha should be larger than. Of course, if alpha is less than mu, this will be close to one for large n. So this is interesting for alpha larger than mu. Um, and you would like to put bounds on this. And there are, of course, uh, all the known ways of doing that. They depend on knowing something more about this, about the distribution of of x, which is uh, of which x1 to xn and so on are, are IID copies. So the 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 most the simplest and most common large deviation setting is that the xn are actually bounded, which means that all all uh, continuous function expectations of x also exist, including all the moments. So. So let's assume, um, squeeze this in here, assume that the xi are, if they are bounded, then without loss of generality in the unit interval. So this mu is also a number between 0 and 1. And then there is a well-known uh, bound for this, which is asymptotically optimal. So it's something like this, e to the minus n d of alpha mu. Where your plus and mu is, is this here uh, alpha log alpha over mu plus one minus alpha log one minus alpha. So this is indeed a relative entropy between two binary uh, variables, which is always positive. Uh, so this has to be true for. So then this is a positive number, and, uh, and then you can, you can easily upper bound this, for example, again by e to the minus 2n alpha minus mu squared, which for, for small alpha minus mu, so that's the amount of deviation, this is, so this, this is kind of the, the right order of this uh, relative entropy. 
So, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen how to, to prove these kind of things, but I, I just want to show you quickly how you, how you do that. Um, so this probability that we are looking at, 1 over n xi larger than alpha, So here I'm just comparing two numbers. So I can, I can do the same thing by comparing monotonic functions of these numbers. And I choose the exponential function, which is somehow, uh, you can choose any function. You can try this thing with any function. But somehow, the, it, become, it becomes nicest and, and interesting asymptotically optimal if you choose the exponential function. So this is the same as the probability that e to the and let me also introduce a parameter that we have to fix some, some arbitrary t, sum xi, is larger than e to the n t alpha. Right? That's, that's the same. Of course, I need t is larger than 0 for this. And then we use a, a, a very, very simple bound, which is, which is usually called Markov or Chebyshev, or a number of other names that I guess you can attach to this, which is that if you have any, notice that this is now non-negative values. If you have any positive value to random variable, then and you compare the, the, you want to, then the probability that it, it exceeds a certain bound is upper bounded by the expectation of this variable. So with the expectation of this e to the t, divided by this bound. And it's an elementary fact, e to the n to the half. And uh, well, OK, the beautiful, now we have to, now at this point we use the independence, because of course this e to the sum is just a product, and then the expectation is also a product. And since they are all IID, this, this expectation is simply the same. So we get the expectation of e to the t x. And for each of these guys, I get a minus t alpha here to the power n. So and at that point, you see is if you, are, if you can choose t such that this is less than 1, you get exponential decay here. Right. And then, uh, so but how do you calculate this? So that apparently, this depends on the distribution of, of x. So I'm, I, this is a kind of a, a little exercise in, in, uh, in uh, convex, convexity. Um, how do you call this thing? Uh, uh, Jensen's inequality. So for, for fixed mu, for fixed mu, and recall that x is between 0 and 1, uh, this is max. This expectation is maximized when x is a Bernoulli variable. It's from the convexity of the exponential function, you should distribute your weight on the on the edges. Max for x equal to Bernoulli mu. And in this case, it's very easy to evaluate this because then I have just two events with probability. Mu, I get a 1. It's probably 1 minus mu, I get a 0. And then I can do this expectation. So I get 1 minus mu times e to the 0 plus mu e to the uh, t, or oh, any this one here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. e to the minus alpha. Plus mu e to the one minus alpha. Since. Yeah, no, that should be correct. To the power n, and there's a t missing somewhere. Let me try it again. So one minus mu e to the t alpha plus mu e to the t one minus alpha everything to the power n. 
And it's still true for all t, right? And it's obviously useless if, if this thing in the bracket is larger than 1. But it turns out you can make it less than 1 <coughs> by optimizing optimize t. And then you get exactly the thing over there. And so, and so as in, in the end, you get this. You get e to the minus n t of alpha uh, mu. Which one? Minus. <laughs> I couldn't even see it from here. You know. Congratulations to your eyes. <coughs> yes, here. Yeah, okay. So optimizing this, of course, is again is a simple exercise. I mean, it's a, it's a very simple function. So you just find the critical point. Of thing. And that's it. So, so it's a very, I mean, just to get the inequality is a very simple trick, right? It's just this exponentiation and then, and then uh, Markov's inequality, which if you don't know it, this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a simple exercise. Okay. So I would like to do a different thing. So I want to do the same thing. Oh, no, wait, let me, let me say a small thing, of course. This is for real values, but of course it's this the same kind of thing. You get you get the same kind of bound if the x's are uh, vectors over the reals. No, no, sorry, I just missed one thing. You said optimize over what to get the thing? Over t. You optimize okay. t because I introduced t as a free parameter here. Okay. So you and this so this t the optimal t will depend <coughs> on uh, sorry at this point here. The, to find the optimal t is a, is a hard problem. In fact, in the abstract large deviation theory, that's where you kind of stop. You simply call this the, I mean, without the alpha here, this is the, 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 the exponential uh, or the moment generating function. And, uh, and, well, ultimately, you need to find this minimum. So when you take the, the log and minimize over t, this is essentially a it's called a, 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 a Legendre transform. So in this case, we are, I mean, because everything is very elementary, we can, and since I'm only asking about upper bound, let me put it this way, right? So obviously, this is that's very particular here. So since I'm only interested at this point in an upper bound, I just look for the worst case distribution. It turns out to be the extreme one, which is Yeah, so this t is with some kind of horrible thing, it's like ln alpha over mu, uh, 1 minus mu, 1 minus alpha, or something like this. It's not particularly light. And I think at that point, you really, really require that alpha is larger than mu so to know that this is larger than 0, actually. <laughs> Otherwise, of course, this is not right. So this is true for comparing a single numerical average with a with a mean, and of course this the same will I mean you can do the same if if the x are real uh, vectors over the reals. If if your if your if your notion of deviation is that a single one of the coordinates deviates from the mean by is larger than its alpha, I mean each coordinate has its own mean, then of course all you get is you get uh, a prefactor due to the union bound. It's, the prefactor is simply the number, the, the number of entries in your vector. It's, it's the dimensionality of your vector. So and that's that's still a very useful thing because because the the, the exponential here, well, this the probability of a single one goes exponential with n. So you can you can actually counterbalance rather long vectors in this way and still have a very small probability that even a single one of the entries deviates, a single one of the entry averages deviates from the mean. Yeah, it's clear what I'm saying. So this is just a single event. I, I mean, if I, I, I would like to view this maybe as just entries in a, in a single, some entries in a vector, and then I can, I can get statements for, for the global behavior of the, of the whole vector just by unit now. So we want to do similar thing for matrices. So that's the setting 
we have x1 to xn, x, and so on. I want them to be in the unit interval. Same thing, I want them bounded, but by rescaling, I put them in the unit interval in some over in some uh, matrix space. So I remind you that the dimension is at this moment still finite, even though this actually makes even sense for B of H. Um, and I want them to be <coughs> IIB. And so each of these matrices, I mean, the distribution of X itself can be very complicated. Right? I mean, there are A, a dimension A by dimension A many entries, and they have some joint distribution. So as maybe worth stressing, this is rather almost nothing to do with what people call random matrix theory, where you build a matrix by picking, I mean, where you really build a matrix by picking independent entries. I mean, that's kind of the, the basic Wigner setting that you, that's, it's, it, the random matrix theory becomes very, very complicated if you, if you don't have a, a certain degree of, of independence between the entries. Or, Alternatively, if you, are you have to assume that the distribution is a huge degree of symmetry because then you use the representation of whatever group is acting here. So we don't, have to, we don't want to do this. The single distribution can be anything. Our, our, the regularity will originate because we take many in, independent instances, samples from the same distribution. Yeah, and then we form the same kind of thing. So 1 over n, sum of xi. And if the matrices are finite with probability one, I will converge to the mean, right? Um, and because of what I said before, you even get a kind of a large deviation theory because the matrix, after all, is just a different way of writing down an n squared long vector. So, so I know that entry-wise, these matrices, they will obey a, a large deviation principle. You can just know. If I, if I put this probably is M, so this is a unit interval. Do you consider geometric mean also? Geometric mean of, of what? the matrices. Yeah, yeah, this one, yeah. Uh, I'm just asking that question. Ah, no, well, no, no, not here. No, no, no. I just Only so here. for this, for this, I will just want to. Because uh, there is well developed theory for that. Yes, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, uh, yeah, but this is li actually leads to something very, very yeah, different. I am slightly confused with your notion of IID. Yeah. Does that imply that the, the matrix entries will be IID? When you say that the x's are the no, each, 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 uh, each uh, x is a matrix. And I'm just saying that these here are all independent matrices. Okay, well, that, that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that for, for, for the matrix x, all the matrix elements have a joint distribution, which is implicit. I, I agree. So, so it, it is not clear that the 1, 1 entry of the x is of the same distribution. No, 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 they don't have to be. So then how, then how can you assume compare the scalar case to this? Because, because x is just a vector of numbers. So like I look just at the particular matrix element, the ij. Oh, so you look at the vector version of the, yeah. of the plus division. I mean, this convergence here in the finite dimension case just means that if all the n square matrix elements converge. Right? And of course, it also happens with probability 1. And in fact, I can even use this kind of the sort of union, uh, this union bound argument. So maybe I shouldn't say x. So it's a dimension a squared. So the, the so when I look at this matrix, so what I can say, for example, that this this matrix here, it has all these a squared entries. Around each of them, I just put a small interval. So the probability that this this av this uh, um, empirical average is outside of the box this is the product of all these intervals goes exponentially to zero. <coughs> I mean, that of course is a true statement, and uh, we can derive it from the previous one. No? 
known uh, previous previous one, but it's oddly useless for for many things because in matrices we have actually I shouldn't yeah I should be actually quite quite precise. So these are these are in particular Hermitians. Right? This is in the, this is a positive less than one. So so there is the order structure. It's like in the real numbers. What we what I really want to do is I want to I want to compare I want to make sure that that this mean actually <coughs> compares to n. The, M, the empirical average compares to n. So this is what I want for a larger than m. So this is comparing in the matrix order. I would like a bound on the probability that 1 over n sum xi is is not upper bounded by a. Yeah, so this is my notion of this is my notion of a large deviation here. Just going from the order of the reals to the order on the uh, matrices. And, uh, and of course, if you know something about individual matrix entries, and especially if the, matrix, if the so A is maybe, A is, A is, A is very bad too. What did I call this thing before? Uh, Where well, it was alpha. Oh yeah, never mind. Never mind. It's just <laughs> forget about the given. So let's say we have here d by d matrices. Yeah, so especially if d is large, uh, then then knowing. That, 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 that the matrix is a small perturbation of another one, it doesn't imply a lot about, for example, n norm differences. Usually, you will have a dimension dependent factor. And the order, you may completely uh, fall out of this because it's just a partial order. Right, so, we, want, we, we expect this to be small. Why? Because with probability 1, this, this uh, mean converges to n. So, it means for large n, with very high probability, it will be in a very tiny ball around n. So, it's basically n plus minus an epsilon of the, of the unit matrix. And that will be included here because I want A to be strictly larger than N. And so A minus N is positive definite. Yeah, so if, if I can make sure this is small, it means that with high probability, the, the, the empirical mean actually is less than A. And uh, in particular application, we, we let a equal to, for example, 1 plus some epsilon times m. So we can even make a, a relative error version of, of, of this. So this exponential. Yeah, and that, so the prelude about large deviation theory was just to prepare that such a thing should exist. And it's only a question of how you do it. <laughs> so this that it start with a with a lemma because I, what I will do is I will just try to imitate this trick taking the exponential, which in the probability literature is called the Bernstein trick of the, I guess, 19th century mathematician. So for that, I need this Markov inequality. Matrix. So if x positive standard <coughs> M is the expectation, so I assume that it exists, and A again is some positive definite. So then the probability that X is not upper bounded by A 
Yeah, I have to do these things because the operator order is just a partial order. Right? I can, I mean, obviously, writing x larger than a is a much, much weaker thing. This is upper bound by the trace of m a inverse. And I would like to leave this as a homework because it's a very elementary thing to prove. You just you just try, I mean, if you don't know, if, well, either you remember how you proved this for uh, one by one matrices, that's real numbers, or you try to do it for them first and then you realize what is the trick to do. Okay, so let me see. I want to, I don't want to necessarily state the most general. Um, First of all, so assuming that this expectation of x with m is larger than some real number mu times identity or you larger than zero. <coughs> so this is an assumption I will make from now on. When you think about sampling problems, it's a very natural assumption. If you have an event, I mean, so, so in Bernoulli variables, if your expectation is small, that means that the event one has an extremely small probability. And that means you need to sample a large number of times before you get an idea what this probability is like. So, so for, for to simplify the discussion here, I will just assume that there are not these rare events, if you want. And that corresponds to here, in our setting, it corresponds to saying that the mean doesn't have tiny, tiny eigenvalues. So we have some lower bound on, on this bound. So this, I mean, you might say this is some a priori knowledge on the distribution. Then y defined as m to the minus a half x m to the minus a half rescaled by mu. This is in the unit interval <coughs> by assumption here. And the expectation of y is mu times identity. And of course, also true that the probability that x is, less, is not less than uh, a is the same as the probability that y is not less than a prime, which is mu m inverse <coughs> a m to the minus one. Yeah, so so that tells us that in this kind of setting, without loss of generality, we can we can assume this. We can uh, think of the expectation of x as being proportional well, being, being to new identity. So it's it's a it's it's a it's a small simplifying. Okay, and then and then I'm asking. Of course, a prime here, it inherits the the fact the the, the property is it's strictly larger than the expectation. So that means that all of the eigenvalues of a prime are strictly larger than mu. So I get a prime is larger equal than some alpha times the identity, which is larger <coughs> than mu. Okay, and in this setting, I would like to uh, 
to to state the, uh, a bound. So it's, it looks like a very simple, like a very simple one. So I guess this is. So then the probability that uh, one over n is not bounded by alpha identity. So meaning that one that this event just say that takes one of the eigenvalues of this object that exceeds alpha is bounded by, and this looks really like a union bound, except interestingly, you would think the union bound with d square events, because I have d square matrix and actually it's only d here. e to the minus <coughs> relative entropy between alpha and d. Relative entropy, it, it, I mean, it takes some while to get used to it. So this is another little remark. So um, mu of alpha mu is larger or equal than 2 alpha minus mu squared. So that's a, that's a good bound if the difference here is fixed. Uh, in another, another interesting application is when, when, this, when, uh, when the, the comparison bound is a constant multiple of the mean uh, of the of, yeah, of the expectation. So a is one plus f one plus minus epsilon times m, and then this alpha, of course, is one plus minus epsilon times mu. And you can do such a thing. So alpha is one plus epsilon mu. Alpha mu is largely equal than some. If I could ever remember this. Some constant uh, mu epsilon squared. So this can be very good if mu is tiny, and then also for any kind of interesting application, also alpha should be tiny. Then this is too bad. So whereas here this, this quadratic dependence is only on the relative error, and uh, and uh, mu is in, only in this linear. So these are these are two things that are easy to easy to understand. Okay, so yeah, so you understand that this this particular setting that I assume that this is the identity, that this is mu times identity, and also that, that I'm comparing with an alpha times identity is not such a terrible specialization because I can all I mean whenever I have a generic situation, I can always transform it to make the mean proportional to the identity, and then. I'm losing a little. I'm actually upper bounding a little bit by by uh, by if by reducing a prime by making it also just reducing all the arguments to the same. Yes. Yeah. yes. From the first inequality, yeah. you the second one, you get the mu squared. Uh, two mu squared should be right. Sorry, I didn't say that this in, if that implies that one. These are independent things. So there's a much so much stronger inequality here. If mu is small, it's much stronger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. If this is this is preferable if mu is small. It also is preferable in the sense that it allows you to talk about relative errors. I mean, it's kind of if you have events with small frequencies, then 
then uh, making, a, making a small absolute error means basically it's okay to never observe this very event. But if you, if you only demand small relative error, then you need to observe that, otherwise you don't have statistics. <coughs> so, let me, let me show the proof of this, because it's not very difficult. <coughs> not unexpectedly, we do, we do very much the same things, except that we have to do matrix exponentiation. So that's a, that's a peculiar thing about it. <coughs> so the probability that 1 over n sum is not bounded by alpha density. I would like to say that this is equal to the probability that e to the sum xi is not alpha bounded by e to the nt alpha. Because that's the um, times n times t, and then taking the exponential. <coughs> so unfortunately, these are not, these are not uh, the same. This, I mean, because, and that's because, that's because uh, x going to e to the x is not matrix monotone. But x going to ln x, the inverse is. And so that gives us an inequality here, which is just the right direction. Yeah, because I, what, the, what we do is we look at the complementary events. That e to the sum is larger than the right hand side. Then we can take the log that, that implies that the sum of the xi is larger than nt alpha identity. And that's the complementary event of this. And so for the complementary events, the inequality goes in that direction, which is fine. So I don't know if I have time, but uh, it's kind of it's a, it's a beautiful subject, these matrix monotone functions. So if, I, if you want to have some more homework, I can give you some to prove that, that the ln function is matrix monotone. So to prove this, Ah, yeah, yeah, that's actually true. Yeah, yeah, that's right. In this, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, that's actually right. In this particular setting, it's maybe equal, even actually equal. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Okay, right. <laughs> in, in fact, in the simplified setting, actually, it's even equality. So does it mean we don't need the operator uh, monotonicity of Ln? Well, actually, I write it anyway, because I will just give you the homework. I mean, the proof consists of, of two things. Uh, first, if you have matrices x less than or equal to y, and I guess we need that they are positive definite, then y inverse is less than or equal to x inverse. And the second one is, uh, is the realization that the ln x, of course, that's the integral uh, dt over t from 1 to x. And, uh, and to remove the x from the, from the integration boundaries, you write, you essentially just realize that it can be written as, as, as uh, two integrals with, with uh, fixed integration boundaries. So it goes from 0 to infinity, dt 1 over 1 plus t minus 1 over x plus t. So integral is just a sum, right? I mean, a, a clearly a sum of operator monotone functions is operator monotone. And so all you have to make sure is that each of them is operator monotone. That that's part one. And let me just take the integral, which is, a, I mean, a limit of sums. 
So it must be also operator moment. OK, so yeah, thanks for pointing out that we actually don't need this here. So it's really inequality. And then we do we invoke this Markov bound. So we get uh, this is less than or equal to the expectation of uh, the trace of the expectation e to the t sum xi um, That is just scalar factor, so we don't need to worry about that too much. So the problem is, is now here. Because it is true that, of course, these xi are independent. But, but because they are potentially non-commuting, and that is, in fact, the most interesting case, the e to the sum is not just a product of exponentials, in which case I could use the, the, the independence. But again, there is an inequality that happens to go in the right direction. And that's, at least that's the way I used to think about this until last year when, when Joel Tropp wrote very beautiful notes about this whole theory of, of matrix large deviations. So, so kind of, there is this uh, kind of another lemma that I will not even give a proof because it's, it requires a bit other. Uh, uh, yeah, so we know that in general e to the a plus b is, is, is different from e to the a times e to the b. I mean, first of all, this here in our case will be Hermitian. That one isn't necessary. But the traces compare. So this is called Golden and Thompson. And that allows us to unravel this, this sum here. So because, of course, the expectation is an expectation over succession x1, x2, and so on. So this is upper bounded by um, the trace of the Expectation e to the let's say t x n times the expectation e to the t sum x i i going from one to n. Right. Why is that? First of all, just take the expectation of sum because it's linear. Trace of this e to the sum I can clearly split it by Golden Thompson into e to the txn times e to the t sum of the rest. And then I take the expectation again, realizing that, that these are independent parts, so that I can just take the expectation separately of those. This is really just a product of two expectations, e to the minus n t half. And then I do something kind of dumb, but it, it allows me to do induction. I just replace this here by its norm. And then I can do induction and just iterate this peeling off of factors and I get well, I, I end up with a single trace of an identity, so I get uh, d times the norm of a single of these guys, e to the tx, e to the minus t alpha, to the power n. So and that's kind of at, wi at which point you should try to find a good t that, uh, that does it. And of course, yeah, for, for, first of all, you need an upper bound on this. But you realize very quickly that it's, kind of, it's the same thing. The, the extremal case is when x is, is essentially Bernoulli. So it has a small probability to be uh, a certain probability to be 0 and a certain probability to be the max, which is the identity. 
So this thing here is again 1 less than 1 minus mu plus mu e to the t. And then, of course, I just choose just t to be optimal, and then I get the same thing. d e to the minus n relative function. Yeah, so that's, that's it. So yeah, so I, I mentioned Joel Chopper. I guess I shouldn't, I shouldn't really go into it. So, so this is kind of, uh, this is one way of the, of the induction. So what I, I mean, maybe I just comment a little bit on, on how you can ponder this kind of theory a little bit more. One of the problems is that this manifestly only makes sense for finite dimensional matrices. And for infinite, infinitely large ones, uh, you would hope that maybe you can write instead a trace of a, an exponential op operator here, some e to the minus Hermitian matrix. Um, and that's something that Joel Tromp's work goes a certain way to, because he doesn't do this Golden Thompson step. He has a, a smarter way of, of breaking down this, uh, this, uh, this expectation of the exponential. And maybe I will just write down the, the slightly stronger result that the drop gets. So at, at this point here, So he indeed gets that this is upper bound by the trace oh. No, this is not the last thing you made. The last one? Yeah. So I'm saying I'm just here at this point, if I plug in this upper bound, I'm just in exactly the same situation as in the previous discussions. I get the same optimal upper bound except for this d here, which is the trace of the identity, d to the minus n d of alpha mu. And that's, it, that's exactly, that's the claim here. That's what I wrote. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. So the, for good reason, in the classical large deviation theory, people actually look at the log of this expectation here. Yeah, so that's what we, that's what, what Trop realized that we should do same. So we can upper bound this guy here, and there's this e to the minus n d alpha, and then there's a trace of e to the sum uh, to the n times so you get expectation of e to the t x to the power n. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Sorry. I just need a bit of time to decode this here. So he uses, he uses again the monotonicity, uh, the, the, the monotonicity and concavity of the log, but also an, a stronger property, uh, uh, a trace concavity relation by leap. So it's by a concavity of, of the following map. It maps x to the trace of e to the h plus L of x. So this is defined, this is a function that, is, that depends on the parameter h. And for fixed h and positive definite x, this is, this is a concave function in general. So this is a very surprising fact. And that's what he uses. So clearly this is stronger than what I have because I, instead of just taking the, tra the trace of this nth power, I simply look at the dominating term, the, the largest eigenvalue, and take that one to the nth power and think, OK, Maybe they are all the same, multiplied by d. So this part is much better if you have only one 
dominating, you know, just eigenvalue, and all the others are very small there in, in, this, uh, in this exponential. Okay. So let me see if I have a bit of time to, to discuss applications of this, because that's really what I'm here for, to do a bit of inf information theory. So the, the thing is, this, these inequalities here, this kind of, this kind of theorem and, and slightly general, slightly more general statements of it where I have kind of general matrix A and so on. This I, I invented about 10 years ago, nine, 10 years ago with my late supervisor to solve a particular information theoretical problem. So our, our axes here, they were essentially density matrices small twists, but they, they are, dense, let's say they're density matrices, and uh, from, drawn from certain ensemble. And we were interested in how many, how many samples do you actually need to, to generate uh, uh, a mixture. And the expectation of the ensemble is just the corresponding mixed state of the ensemble. And, uh, in a suitably asymptotic setting, there is an information theoretical answer to that. So I, I want to show this answer in a, in a, in a, with a particular motivation that is maybe interesting from the information theoretical point of view. And I will hopefully also continue with applications uh, tomorrow. So in the meantime, these inequalities, they found other applications in, in quantum cryptography, in other parts of quantum information theory. And what really surprised me was one day, I got, a, I got sent a preprint where, where colleagues of ours, Seth Landau and, and Alex Russell, showed that they can give a new and extremely simple conceptual proof of a theorem by Alon and Reutemann. Uh, if you know graph theory, so then, then it's a Cayley graph for a, for a group and set of generators. You just uh, you take the, you look at the graph. And you consider the, the elements of the group as the, as the vertices and connect two uh, elements by an edge if their quotient is in the set of generators. And let's say that the set of generators is symmetric with respect to taking inverse. This is an undirected graph. So they show that if this set of generators is large enough, if it's larger than log the cardinality of the group, then with very high probability, the resulting graph is an expander graph in the, in the spectral sense. So it's a, always a regular graph, which means that the largest eigenvalue of its adjacency matrix is simply the degree. And, and you can show that all the other eigenvalues are tiny. And you can just put an epsilon, and you can show that they're all in the, in the unit, in the interval from minus epsilon to epsilon, if the if the size of the generating set is some function of epsilon times log of the cardinality of the group. And so this can be, this can be done actually very simply with this, with this tail bound. And I was tempted to show this proof as well, but, but, but since it's not information theory, I, I will skip it. So I, I have a reference in the, in the, in the paper that I produced. So you say Zef Landau? Zef Landau, yeah. yeah. So I, I think I referenced it. And, and even more lately, this, uh, this lemma has found applications in, in, uh, in some parts of compressed sensing theory. So this is uh, in compressed sensing, you try, I mean, the kind of classical way, you try to reconstruct a sparse vector. And they have settings where they try to reconstruct from limited data, uh, not not sparse matrices, but matrices of low rank, where they know that they have low rank. But you don't know necessarily where the, where the range sits. And, uh, and in the algorithm, in the reconstruction algorithms, or rather in the proof of correctness of these algorithms, you use these, <laughs> these bounds. And about that I want to say even less because I, I don't even understand the proof. It's this. Uh, 
So this goes back to an idea of, of Sandro Popescu, my colleague in, in Bristol. It's uh, the, in, in, uh, in statistics, in, in, in information theory, and also in physics, there's kind of this constant discussion of what is a good way of quantifying the amount of correlations in a bipartite system. So the, the The idea of, of these destroying correlations is, is, is we, we somehow try to understand what kind of process is necessary to go from a bipartite state, so this is a state in a, in a bipartite system, to such a thing. So completely, I mean, completely independent entities. So this is one of the many ways you can do this, but it's a, I mean, at that time it was was uh, a new idea. So the, the, of course, we have to somehow, uh, we somehow shift the burden from looking at the state to looking at these processes. So the, the, the fundamental idea is how much randomness do we need to inject into the system to, to make this happen. So not injecting randomness in the system is clearly if we just apply a unitary. Now, with sufficiently large spaces, A, a and B, of course, a, a global unitary, I can always do this. It's basically just a, it's simply a basis change to, to make this happen. Now, let's say this is a pure state, then I can always find some unitary that will map it into a tensor product state. So that's kind of, we should be a bit more careful. So I want to allow only local unitary. Local unitary combinations. In fact, I would I want to uh, for I mean it looks asymmetric and I don't want to discuss this. We can make it symmetric, but for the purpose of what I will discuss, it's simply if you just focus on only such things. Okay, so each of these conjugations, that somehow it's because it's reversible, it's a, the, the idea is, and it's just a local thing, so it's, it's something that one party can decide, they can just do this basic change, they can invert it, that will clearly not change the correlations. I mean, any kind of measure of, quantitative measure of correlation will have to assign the same number to this, to this state and the rotated state. The mixture, that's where we add noise. If you just take probabilistic mixture, it's, it's, it means that we can, we can apply unitaries from a certain set, and then we just forget which one we chose. And the amount uh, of, of randomness we need to do this step, that is our quantification. You could do for the other way round also. Yeah, yeah, in fact, I could also do U8 and so VB. And we need to the same answer, but, uh, but uh, then I have to prove optimality, and then it's uh, Saying that only this one is bigger? No, I'm saying that my model will only allow these things. So yeah, so what we want to do is we want to go from row and B to so sorry, our, our map. Let me write a map. Because that's what it is. So this I mean in the end I want I want to talk about CP maps. The map takes generic x to uh, sum, well, I can have pi, i goes from 1 to some big n, u, i, is an identity, x is the same thing, dagger. For example, uh, for example, if the if the state is the maximum entangled state, so it's one half 
zero zero times one one times the conjugate. Then then to to achieve this one particular way of doing this is that you have u zero, u one, u two, u four, and these are just the, the Pauli operators. And the pi is all one over four. Then you can confirm that t of rho is simply the it will actually give a state of this form, and to be precise, it's this one here. It's the tensor product of the two maximally uh, maximally mixed states. So, and for the quantification of the noise. Uh, there are different ways you can you can approach this. So one of them is somehow you just trust everything you know from thermodynamics. You simply look at the difference in entropies here. Simply the entropy of the final state minus the entropy of the initial state. It's a property of the concavity of the entropy that this is larger or equal to that. Or you could be a bit more conservative and say, well, I don't really know what these quantum entropies mean. Maybe the thermodynamics doesn't really make that much sense. But I know that there is an entropy here. It's a classical entropy, and it's associated with thermodynamic cost. So let's say if I really uh, try to be kind of explicit about the mechanics of things, Alice will have to <coughs> be able to sample from this distribution. So she has to learn I. Then it sits somewhere in the corner of her mind. And you know it's difficult to forget something completely. Maybe you think of the world, but it's still there. You know it. Then she applies the unitary. But then I ask you to forget it, because if it's not forgotten, then the real state of the system is really actually also tensored with some i that is, I mean, with some state that represents i. So the Landauer principle says that there is actually an energy cost associated to erasing information, to physically forget something that is, that is, that is, in, in equili that is kind of an equilibrium state here, to, to set it back to zero, to really make sure you, you forget it, it costs, it, it, the amount is proportional to the entropy. Again, that's only true in the suitable asymptotic limit. So the only, the, 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 the only thing we really know is that actually it can be done with an energy cost that's proportional to log n, which is the largest entropy of all this. So of course this could be uniform distribution. And this will be my, will be my cost measure. So given, given rho a b and integer n, I want to look at rho tensor power n, because all this will only make sense in the, in the, in the, in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, Let's do two definitions. So we call a set of uh, pi, I mean an ensemble of pi and ui. So these are probability and these are unitary, so they are probability space. Ui are unitary on a to the n to the uh, Epsilon randomized. If uh, if it's associated map t, t, so it's some t i So if that is close to a tensor, uh, epsilon close to a tensor product, so I have, oh yeah, one n here. So I need to choose the appropriate norm, so the norm difference from uh, some rho a tilde, that uh, of course lives on, and the, the support of this is the n tensor power of a, 
tensor, and since we're not touching the other system here, I can actually take rho b to the tensor power n. In that place, distance is less than epsilon. What is rho tilde? Rho tilde is an appropriate state for some state. Rho tilde. state in A to the N. And then I say N epsilon implicitly depending on rho of course is simply the minimum mu N such that there exists epsilon randomizing family Pi Ui with N elements <coughs> for rho. <coughs> yeah, so obviously this uh, this notion here it doesn't really doesn't require require the asymptotics. I could define this just for any given state for n equal one. I can ask this, but then it depends on epsilon. So here I have a kind of a, an information set of thermodynamical. I think I can I can play two limits against this either. There's epsilon I would like to make arbitrarily small because there's nothing special about any fixed epsilon. And at the same time I can let n go to infinity. So I can't do this in the in the n equal one setting here because if I let epsilon go to zero then I demand it's actually equal to the tensor product. And then you don't get such a nice answer. So the question is, what's the asymptotic behavior of capital N? And as I said, so this capital N, this is an upper bound on the entropy of this distribution. So we, uh, sorry, the log of it. So we take the log of that to take to mean the noise, the, the amount of uh, the amount of randomness that's needed to be injected in the system. And then, of course, we divide by little n because then we have to normalize. I mean, you, it will turn out that uh, if this actually is a limit. So what, I mean, this just at this point, it just would mean what's the asymptotics of this number. So I mean, that is a, I mean, that is a somehow thermodynamically motivated way of, of, of asking how much correlation is there in the system? Because how much there is, is should be kind of equivalent to how much effort you have to put to, to remove it. So this, this limit here, of course, should, there should be kind of a, a double asymptotics, epsilon going to zero mildly, very mildly as n goes to infinity. You shouldn't make too much assumption how fast epsilon is. Yes, yeah. Uh, why not? Uh, you have taken only one, uh, in the sense, it Sorry? Can you just repeat it? Yeah, so uh, here the correlations, you have said, it kills up, up to the state row in tensor row B. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But not, not separable. He's asking why, why you took the right product. Oh, you mean you want to compare with a separable state yeah. here? Well, I mean, first of all, there are separable correlated states. I mean, I'm interested in correlation of what's, whatever kind, right? So the only states that are really independent, uh, give independent statistics of A and B are these. So of course you can ask, I mean, it's, it's a meaningful question of kind of how much uh, randomness you need to inject into the system before the state becomes separable. And then you would, you would put here a generic separable state. And you would get a well-defined number that has an exponential asymptotic. So this 1 over n log n uh, would converge to something when, as you let epsilon go to 0. But we have not the slightest what it is. I mean, this is, OK, this I'm reporting from, from some work uh, of Sandro Bupescu, who is very Grossman, that I, I contributed this random matrix. 
So yeah, they, 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 they had this other idea that we can also use this to quantify entanglement as kind of how long you have to go here to reach the set of several states. But it uh, seems a very, very difficult question. Even to find bounds, lower bounds, and so on, comparing it with other entanglements, it's, uh, it's, it's wide open, actually. It's, one of, it's a bit of a disgrace because we left it there because we couldn't do really anything else with it. This particular question has a beautiful answer. And I and I want to show you, uh, and I want to show you at least some little bit of it. Let's say let's start with the uh, with the lower bound. So for that. I actually, I, I let the pi ui be epsilon random noise for rho times n. And actually, that's an optimal one. So then that means that, that I should be able to use this comparison. So first of all, uh, I, I, I said it in words, I tried to motivate it by relating it how much you increase entropy, but of course for that to, to make this rigorous we need to be able to relate the entropy increase of the state to the entropy of these guys here. So this is a kind of, this is the first thing, so it's uh, we have uh, the entropy of this uh, Allow me to write it just as a t, t of rho tensor n. Okay, so the entropy is a concave function. So what we know is that the entropy of this whole mixture is larger or equal than the entropy of each and every single one of its terms because they are all the same. However, this is not the direction that we need because actually we expect the entropy to go up quite a lot. So we need an upper bound that is a bound in the other direction. Turns out you can prove that this is entropy of rho tensor power n. In fact, like any of the any of the of the members of the ensemble, because they're all unitary equivalent, plus the entropy of P1 to P n. And in the other direction, we, we want to use the T of rho tensor power n, so that this one is close to a tensor product, so it's close to something that we, we know. Does the inequality is true for anything, or just this particular one? No, no, for this particular one. Sorry, sorry. No, no, okay, the inequality is true in general is the following. The entropy of some pi rho i is less than equal to the sum of pi s of rho i plus h of as a special case where it's rho i are all the unitary conjugated version of, of rho. Because this is a probability signature. So in this one here, it can be lower bounded by, uh, well, it should be, I mean, the idea is since we had this normal approximation, there must be a way in which the functions are close. But of course, there is always a penalty because the function maybe may have a huge Lipschitz uh, constant with respect to its norm, and uh, and that it doesn't is the content of the so-called of the funnels inequality. So we can replace this by S of rho a and tensor rho b. Okay, let me let may I modify the. The, the definition over here a little bit without us. I mean, this is, it, it, it's, a, it's a slightly stronger assumption on this state, rho tilde here. So I just would like it to be <coughs> partial, the correct partial traits. So it's simply sum pi ui rho tensor, rho a tensor n ui dagger. So you can convince yourself that without loss of generality, we may do that. It doesn't change the definition, actually. 
minus, and then uh, the Fanny's inequality demands that, uh, it, sorry, it gives us an epsilon times a log of the dimensionality of the space. So this is the Lipschitz behavior, if you want. Uh, so the dimensionality is A, B, each to the N. And so this is largely equal then. Now I, I use the special form of rho tilde again. Uh, that's why I wanted to change the definition. So they are just convex combination of unitary rotated versions of rho a to the tensor power n. So the entropy by concavity is lower bound by the entropy of rho a. And since now I have here just everything tensor product, I just get n times s of a plus n times s of b. Sorry, let me stop the should really be rho a plus n times s of rho b minus n epsilon log a yeah, so this is just some constant and uh, the dependence on n of course but it's everywhere uh, sorry I am a bit lost uh, a and b are two systems right so what is uh, sorry uh, a and b are two systems right yes. so what is log a, a, a raised to n or uh, some constant it's the dimension here of a okay. And this here, the technically, epsilon has to be small enough, otherwise then you have to add some extra tension. And, and epsilon will go to zero anyway. So I just use some inequalities. That it's kind of it's a it's a it's a um, opposite to the convexity to the concavity. It's kind of a limit to the to the degree of concavity that relates the difference in entropies between the mixture and the and the average entropy to the entropy of the distribution. And this Fanny's inequality, which essentially con expresses the con continuity of the function s with respect to the trace norm, in, in with, uh, with an explicit Lipschitz uh, dependency. Okay, so what is this here? So this is less than or equal to. Well, now again, here we have a tensor product, so we have n times s of rho a b, and here we can put log n. Right? And so, kind of, this is typical information theoretical. Uh, reasoning, you just string everything together in a, in a I mean, you try to repla replace all your combinatorial objects by some entropies or bound them at least. So reading this from from the from the right, we have an upper, a lower bound on log n. So 1 over n log n of n epsilon, because I choose optimally, is larger or equal. So what do I have to do? I bring everything here on the other side and you see there is a quantity appearing that, that I wrote already, it's the mutual information. It's the S of A plus S of B minus the joint S of AB. So this is mutual information of AB of the state rho minus order epsilon. So divide by N in the dimensions are all finite. Yeah, so that proves that the, the lim inf as n goes to infinity and epsilon goes to zero in an arbitrary way of this number here is larger or equal than the mutual information. And you can guess I wouldn't have written this if I couldn't prove that actually you have also inequality in the other direction. And that requires the, the, the matrix, uh, the matrix uh, something bound. So any questions up to this point? <coughs> so I mean, actually, I should maybe it's a pity I, I, I rubbed out the example. No, no, sorry, it's still there. For the maximum entangled state, uh, what's the mutual information? Well, the, the maximum entangled state has the property that both of the reduced states are maximum mixed states, normal, the normalized identity. So each of the S of A and S of B are just log two, which is one for me. And, uh, and the entropy of the state is a pure state is zero. So the mutual <coughs> information of the state is two, which is exactly the number of, of uh, the amount of entropy that I was investing here. I, just, uh, I, mean, I, I used exactly four unitaries to do that. So is this 
always possible going from here to here? That's the second part, the upper bound. I mean, it's not possible to go to the reduced state of, of A, but to some product state, like, like here. Like, I mean, I, the definition is, 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 uh, is consciously written like this. So the, the A part, since we are doing this unit therapy, it doesn't have to be the reduced state of A. It's, it's some n-body state. So you have planned anybody? Yeah. Uh, so that's low a, to the A is now or if I just defer it for tomorrow. So for the upper bound, I have to find unitaries. And we use the sampling to actually draw them at random from a suitable ensemble. So we just start, oh no, sorry, sorry. we start with something else. So, but to, before we can do this, we have to somehow massage the state a little bit. Because the state, it lives on some arbitrary Hilbert space. So it has all these different degrees of freedom. and uh, and. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't first somehow bring it into some normal form, you will never have a chance of seeing these entropies appearing as counting appropriate degrees of freedom. So I, I just, without proof, I invoke the typicality uh, principle. state rho and AB that is actually so it's a state in A n and to B n uh, with the following properties rho n minus rho tensor power n the previous one is let's say with the epsilon so it's for a generic epsilon larger than zero. So these are the properties. <coughs> Property two. <coughs> the range of rho n of the support is, is contained in two subspaces, A tensor in the tensor product of two subspaces, so A is a subspace in A n, and B hat is a subspace in B n, with the dimension of A hat bounded by uh, 2 to the n times entropy of A plus epsilon. I think I can say to take the same epsilon 
and for all epsilon and large enough n. They exist all these things. The support of B is less than or equal to 2 to the n S of B plus epsilon. Um, And, uh, and in addition, I, I know that the eigenvalues of this row to the n and of its reduced states are, are somehow almost uniform. So this is a typicality, sometimes also called almost asymptotic equipartition property. Because, so what I, what I want to say is that um, on its range, rate rho to the n is larger or equal than uh, 2 to the minus n s of a b plus epsilon. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, there must be, oh, no, no, that's correct. I'm not doing well here. And also rho uh, the partial traces of a to the n, this is larger than 2 to the minus n x of a b b plus epsilon. And the same thing <coughs> for, for b, so also for b to the n, I get a. Yeah, so the range, the, the range of these two reduced states, you can think of them as just being equal to a hat and b hat. And these dimensions, reduced states, you can think of them as just being equal to a hat and b hat. And these dimensions here, there's something wrong with the plus or minus epsilon here. No, it's not really. I shouldn't have started. Maybe I will just do the same thing again tomorrow. So the idea is that because the, the dimensions here are essentially 1 over this right hand side, uh, maybe I should just do different epsilon. Then, then the so the, the eigenvalues are not really the, they are not really uniform, but they are with, uh, on a logarithmic scale. They, are, they look like and uh, and you have similar inequalities in the other direction. So we have two to the minus n s of a b minus n two to the minus n s of a s of b s of a. So this is property three. And you can do this. So you can you can. You can change the state in such a way that it, it, it only you only affect an epsilon part of its whole amplitude. I mean, it's a major case in this trace norm. Really, I mean, actually, we're looking at trace norm. So, so in the in the second step, I will I only have to do the decorrelation for rho n, and that's it. Only. Okay, and that I will do honestly tomorrow.